Welcome. We've got a great show for you today. We have Don Vaughn has invited us back into his classroom, his law school classroom over at Wake Forest University School of Law. And today we will see Larry Pollard, a good friend of mine. I've known him since I was 18 years old. And Larry is known uh, for the creator of the owl theory, which uh, is, is going to be presented to this law school class as an alternative theory of a crime. Uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, person who was charged with the crime is in prison now, and uh, Don and, and uh, Larry came to this uh, agreement to have this for these kids to learn an alternate theory of a real crime. Uh, I enjoyed it. I always enjoy being around Larry and with Don. And you're a student of the staircase. What what were your ideas? So I'm a student of the staircase from my wife. You know, it's, I don't know what it is about women that are fascinated with you know the shows like Dateline and 48 Hours. I actually started watching this on vacation while we were in Clearwater wow. four or five years ago. And one of the interesting things, by the way. If, you haven't seen it, you have to go watch The Staircase. Now, we can't sell anything on here, but if you happen to have Netflix or uh, you, you know, you're using your brother's or your sister's account or whatever, your cousin, <laughs> your, their account, you know, go ahead and watch The Staircase. It's, it's a long series, but watch the series first. And I believe there was an HBO series that I was enlightened upon doing this program. Well, and theirs well. was more Hollywood. The one you're referring to is the documentary, which is really the one you should see because you will actually see the personalities uh, as they and, took place. And it's amazing what happens when you see the series, the Netflix series. You watch the whole thing and you're like, my God, there's no way he didn't do it. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. then I come into this classroom and I'm watching this Larry Pollard and it's fascinating because I was like, wow, he's really almost selling me. And you know what's crazy is you even warned me before I got yeah, in here. I said, you will believe him. Said, you, you will leave. believe him. But I also, when we left, I said, well, I also have to take into consideration the fact that this guy is a lawyer. His job is convincing you. But Larry does more <laughs> than just convince you in the sense that he's done his homework. He knows more about owls than just about anyone I've ever met, including you know, the, the folks that run the Raptor uh, uh, place over in, in Winston-Salem, the Wild Raptors, uh, and I can't remember the name, but it's part of their Nature Science Center over there. But he knows as much about an owl as anyone I have ever met, and I think that's part of it. He actually believes every word of what he's saying. And he loved his neighbor, and he realizes in his mind that He's got to save his neighbor. Well, look forward to this. Stick around for the next hour as we present the Owl Theory. Law School. Uh, this will be filmed by Cable 8 as we did the Mayor's very professional production. And today we're going to talk about something that has been 
on the minds of many over years. It's been on Netflix, HBO Max, and it tells a different story than what actually happened. Larry Pollard over here has been a special prosecutor in the North Carolina Attorney General's office. He was a proud graduate of this law school and has practiced law in Durham for close to 50 years. He was the next door neighbor to Michael Peterson. And in this, I'm just reading from the, from the HBO Max series, The Staircase, season one, episode one. On the 24th of February, 2017, Michael Peterson woke up in a bed before a voice recording gets played where he's in a state of panic and he says that, quote, she's not breathing and flashes back to the night of Kathleen Peterson's death. His son wakes in a passenger seat to flashing lights outside of the house. Todd rushes in the family room and now has a heavy police presence inside. Kathleen is dead at the bottom of the stairs. While his mice claim that she fell down the stairs, he cradles her and the scene gets declared as a crime scene. And it went on for there. By happenstance, this fine lawyer, Larry Pollard, is the next door neighbor. Comes from a very fine family in Durham and he will tell you about having gone through many months of this trial, he finally believes that it didn't happen the way it was prosecuted. Now, the reason we're teaching this at law school is for you to think out of the box. Don't trust evidence as you originally get it. There may be other ways and other methods and other things. And it's for you to be creative. Had Larry Pollard not been creative, we wouldn't be here today. I'm in a hunting blind down east, Pamlico County, and Larry comes up to me after this hunt is over and said, Don, I gotta show you something. I said, Larry, what is it? He said, look at this. And he brings these talons and puts them on a head. I said, Larry, what in the world is that? And he said, you're not going to believe this, but you've heard of the Peterson case out of Durham. Well, everybody who's been around the law profession all heard about the Peterson case. It's one of the most famous cases in, uh, in North Carolina. And he said, Don, it didn't happen the way they said it did. And I said, well, Larry, how do you know this? He said, look at the scalp, look at the talons, look at the top of the head. And he said, an owl did it. And I think, Larry, have you been drinking out of the duck blind? <laughs> Come on in. I'm down. This is your introduction. Okay. And this is Larry Pollard. Everybody give him a round of applause. <laughs> Larry, what year did you graduate from this law school? Uh, 1974. 1974. And been just a fine lawyer ever since. I gave the introduction of the, the movie The Staircase here just a little bit to sort of set a tone here. Sure. And I was telling them how you and I were hunting with our, our friends down in eastern North Carolina on a very cold December day. And we were coming back into the lodge and we walk in and, and Larry shows me the talons on top of the head, the skull. And dadgum, if they don't fit right on the top of the skull. I said, Larry, why are you showing me this? And he said, because I really found the truth out on the Peterson case. And I thought, Larry, that's fine, but where's this thing going to go? Well, folk, it's gone to Netflix, it's gone to HBO, it's gone to books uh, that he's going to show you in just a minute. Larry, tell them how in the world you got involved and in, in, why you're here today on the owl theory. And I'm going to give you Larry Pollard. Thank you, Don. I'll be delighted to go over that and <coughs> share whatever information that I have and show you some props and things of that nature. But first, I want to say I want to 
give credit where credit is due, and that is to my good friend Don Ball, who's invited me over, and I appreciate it. This is Larry's, I think, either fourth or fifth trip to this class. And it always rates at the end of the year a, 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 a rousing hand of applause for what he did uh, against some very he heavy odds. Yeah. He was against the uh, district attorney's office. Uh, he was against public comment. And he stood up. And he's proved that this is a very plausible theory in this Peterson case. May we all be that kind of good lawyer in the future. Continue on, Larry. Sure. And I want to give credit also to Wake Forest University. This is where I was trained to be a lawyer, right here in this law school. And I learned my lessons well. I had wonderful professors. Uh, Dr. B um, Professor uh, Rhoda Billings, who was Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court at one time. Leon Corbett taught me criminal law. I uh, had uh, procedural stuff with Sizemore, and I got to use the resources of Dr. Peter Weigel over in the biology department. Uh, he didn't know what I was doing up here in his, but I was in a three-piece suit looking at me. He said, what, what's a man doing in here in my office on biology and whatever? I said, well, I need to ask you some questions. He said, what were they? I said, can you tell me about an owl? He said, oh yeah, I can tell you a lot about an owl. In fact, I've got all kinds of demonstrations you need. And from that moment on, he became a very uh, terrific witness and supporter of the owl theory. And he would go over at the corner of Church, I mean, uh, Polo and Renola Road over there with some property, and he would find out things about owls. And we'll, I'll get into that right quick in a little while. But once this started, um, it was 20 years ago, 23 years ago, something like that, I can't remember, December the 9th, 2001. And I became involved with it because I happened to be Mr. Peterson's next door neighbor, literally as far as uh, close as the other section of the law school here. And these boards that I brought to you to see and understand, this little one right here shows the, the plot of land and also right here. I had these uh, made up so that you can see the entire land, not just the layout of the house. And this is the house. Hey, flip, flip it over. Yeah, flip it over. You yeah, picked the right way. Okay. This is the house like this, and my house is right here. And right here is what is a barn. It is an old implement barn from when this area was a farm. And this is where the owls go to roost sometimes. In particular, the barn owl. The barn owl has got a great big white face. It gives a horrible call. It will scare you the pants off of you if you're walking in the woods at night and you hear it. You think it's the devil out for you. Uh, but the one that was the real culprit in this instance was this little fellow right here. This is a barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D. And he is bigger than a barn owl in a meaner disposition. And he will hit you when you least expect it. And he is teed into wherever he sees movement. He's sitting up on the, the uh, limb somewhere and he looks down and he sees the movement of the color white on like this right in here, which you'll see. Once it starts to move around, that ignites the instinct to want to attack. He associates that with a meal. And the meal is sometimes right, sometimes wrong. Let me turn that thing off. The owl's off. calling in now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's the owl calling me again. <laughs> now, this guy, he makes the sound, whoo, 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 whoo. And this little guy over here, he's a screech owl. And he goes, hey, 
Yeah. And all of them have different sounds. And the bigger one is the great horn owl. And the great horn is bigger than this one. And he is called the tiger, fly, the flying tiger in the nighttime sky. They can literally fly in, pick up a deer, and throw it over on the ground. And they are powerful birds, and they can do a lot of damage to you. And the reason I brought all these things here, I want you all to see the real McCoy. This and this one right here are what caused this whole thing to come about. And that is because Mrs. Peterson, and I know this for a fact because I drove by that house that night and it was lit up by floodlights here shining up and also floodlights shining down. Big area over here in the yard. And we drove by the house and I was going, golly, look at that. The house, I've never seen it so beautiful and I lived next to it for 55 years. And I grew up next to it. I grew up playing in the house and in the yard. And I was, you know, we came, I said, is he having a party? And he didn't invite me. And so we drove by and I looked and said, no, nothing, nothing up there. No cars were in the circular drive out back on the Kent Street side of the house. And that's... So uh, when you arrived on the scene, the police were there, the lights are going. No, 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 the police not there. They're not there yet. No, they're not there yet. Uh, this all started... Look at the camera right now. Okay. Uh, this all started about uh, 9 o'clock when I went to dinner at a restaurant in downtown Durham. And I'd been out deer hunting that day and came back when my wife wanted to go shopping for a Christmas present and then she wanted to go for dinner, whatever. Well, that's what we did. And we came back by the same way that we went out. And I looked in the circular drive and there was nothing in that circular drive. Now, the circular drive is what I'm talking about. is right there, right there. And I don't know where that other one is, but yeah, I think I got so it. There's a circle drive in front of the house. Yep. Well, nope. The circular drive right here, that is on the Kent Street side. Cedar Street is right here on the bottom. This is the swimming pool. This is the barn. And this is the house where this all took place. Now, she had, and her husband had been out by the pool according to one of the theories, and he came in to the house here, or she came into the house to get some information. She was got a, a meeting the next day. He stayed out there, but when he finally came inside, he found his wife, Kathleen, at the bottom of the stairs, which is right there. All right, give us just a little bit of background on who Kathleen was, who he sure. was, just... Okay. Enough to go on. All right. Kathleen was the wife of Michael Peterson. And she had been married before, divorced. She had one daughter, Caitlin. And uh, Michael had two sons. They had lived over in Germany when he was in the military. Now, moving on, that night, about midnight, we rode by the house coming back home from the restaurant, and we didn't see anything in that circular drive out back. We didn't see anything. Now, the next morning, not the next morning, excuse me, one day more, uh, two days later, there was a picture in the newspaper of two police officers right next to these two wooden balsa Christmas deer. And Mrs. Peterson had gone out there that night to put up these uh, Christmas deer because she had her children coming into town for the Christmas holidays. They were all going to the governor's mansion two days later. Now I'm gonna demonstrate something to you so you understand what I'm trying to convey in the owl theory. Most people say, oh, why did you get involved in this? I said, well, I got involved simply because I was the man's next door neighbor. And as such, I owe my next door neighbor a responsibility a responsibility that he's living there next to me and I consider myself a Christian and as such it says in the Bible if your neighbor needs help help him do unto others as you would have them do unto you now this is important I'm going to tell you this ground level and that was the first responsibility that first thing I got involved with it for the second thing that I've been involved with it 
for the past 20 years is the, it is an obligation that I have as an attorney, not just an obligation to Mr. Peterson, but also to the state. And I didn't know what was going on over there, otherwise I would have told more about it. The obligation is to provide whatever facts and knowledge that I knew about that neighborhood and that house. I lived there for now 75 years. At that time it was 55 years and I knew every little critter that ran around in the woods, in the land, in the bushes and whatever, and the birds that lit in the trees, including the owls. So I've got an obligation and a special knowledge that most people don't have about this particular case. And I try to enlighten the defense counsel. I try to enlighten the authorities, which were the district attorney's office, whatever, because I have that obligation as a sworn attorney and also because I'm the next door neighbor. That's okay. two reasons. And the last reason I've been involved in this case for so long is I got involved with it and I have a sworn duty to do my best for my client, but also for the state, but also for everyone. Because that is when you take an oath of office to be a lawyer, you say that I solemnly swear that I want to be an attorney and I want to promote justice. And justice is something that's very big in today's politicians' minds and everything else. And it's a fact. And the people that know the best about communicating justice are the attorneys. And that's why I give credit to Wake Forest University, my instructors, and that is why I've been involved in this case for up to, hmm, I think right now it's close to 23 years. 23 so, years. so Larry, let's set the sure. tone. Mm -hmm. They said that Michael Peterson, who is a noted, noted author, yes. a combat veteran from Vietnam, mm -hmm. killed his wife at the bottom of the steps. Right. Set that tone for us, how she was found, and let's talk about blood spatter, and end up getting out because of a motion for appropriate relief based upon the blood spatter expert was a crook. He was a crook. He had falsified his information to the State Bureau of Investigation and nobody at the SBI had thoroughly checked him out. He said, I know blood spatter and he did 50, 55 cases. I've had three of them I've had overturned on a motion for appropriate relief to go back into court. Set the tone that night. Okay, the tone that night was that she went back inside, uh, like I said, to get a telephone call she was waiting for. Michael stayed outside by the pool. When he goes in, he finds his wife laying at a pool of blood at the bottom of the staircase, and that's the back staircase, which came up from the, uh, came up from right back in here, right there, that little area right there. And that's where she was found in a pool of blood. On the walls were 10,000 spots of blood. Okay, Right here is where we're talking about. And out here, over in this area, excuse me, over here, is where the swimming pool is. And she had gone back through here, gone down, uh, gone into the kitchen, whatever, and then later on, we think that she went out this way to the circular drive to put up these particular reindeer. And this is where all hell broke loose. And it's, well, the reason for that is because when owls are in a tree and they see the movement of the color white, then that ignites their instinct to go down and hit something. Now, when that happens, you're saying, well, how could she have put all this? Why would you know, let me show you what it takes to put one of these things together. She's out there, she's moving around, she's right about this tall or whatever. She's moving this thing around, and she's moving this thing around here, and they're talking about, 
where's this going and what's that going to do and where's the legs over here. At any rate, you get the idea. There is a lot of movement of the color white against the solid uh, circular drive grassy area, which was dark dirt. And that is what caused this. These so are this the owl is attracted to this white. It's yep. dark outside, so the owl comes in to investigate. Yep. See, so she's out there and she's going like this, and then she's going to uh, put this over here and get some more things for the legs, and then she's going to get the reindeer. Uh, here we go. Here's the horns. One of them busted. But at any rate, these are the horns that are out there, and she's putting all this together. And now I brought this here, it takes too much long to put it together, but you get the idea. You see the movement of it, and she's out there by herself working on this thing. She's not aware of a bird up above her, but that bird's watching, because this is when he gets his meals. He, she's close to the swimming pool, which is a source of water, where all the little animals come up at nighttime to get a little drink of water in the dark. And over here is where the white is, and that means it's either a rabbit, a skunk, or whatever you want to call it, a cat, uh, a ra uh, what did I say, a skunk, a rat. Uh. Now this was thoroughly investigated by the Durham Police Department, yep. the yep. State Bureau of Investigation, yep. other authorities, and they didn't even think about an owl being involved with this That's trap. Right. And it goes to a jury trial in Durham Superior Court. Judge, Judge Harden, see the prosecutor, he was the prosecutor. Harden was the prosecutor. Jim Harden. Jim Harden, very fine, very fine prosecutor. Very fine for now prosecutor. Now Superior Court Judge. I know him very, very well. And he's a fine gentleman. And he had been a prosecutor for a long time. After this case, he decided that he was going to... Uh, he had been in the Army Reserve, and he was going to go to Iraq and be in the, uh, what do they call that, JAG program over there, as a judge over there. And uh, eventually, he was in hopes that he was going to be elevated up to be uh, a judge in, uh, in exactly. Durham or in the statewide. Some people were touting him as a candidate for Attorney General. And if he had been Attorney General and elected, he would have been a very good person to have it. Now, some of the things, though, that happened that night were a little different, and that's where this new book comes in, and that's because there was a lot of investigating that went on, and it started about 2 o'clock in the morning, and the people that were on the investigation staff, the detectives and whatever, to be quite honest, a lot of people, especially in the book, the new book, they came to seem to think that the authorities didn't do a good job, or wasn't fair, or they were hiding evidence. I don't take that position. I take this position. It's late, two or three o'clock in the morning. It's cold. It is dark. It is well, it wasn't it wasn't cold, cold then, but it was cool. It was, the temperature was dropping. But the main thing was, you had youngsters, basically not youngsters, but not really experienced investigators. And there were no lawyers around, they were just investigators. Everybody was trying to find out what was going on when Mr. Peterson came into the house and found his wife at the bottom of the steps, bleeding, blood all over the walls, and they said, oh, well, it looks like a murder because all the blood's out there. We call that a rush to judgment. And that's why I'm trying to tell y'all in the future, any of you that go into criminal law, don't do a rush to judgment. Take your time to look at the facts. Analyze the facts before you let out on something. See, and that's see, what I did. She's dead at the bottom of the step. Mm -hmm. There's blood spatter against the wall, on the steps, on her. If this is a key. I can almost give you a lecture now. Here's the key. So they did an examination. <clears throat> this is, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning. And they didn't do a thorough examination. I'm talking about the, the head and the feathers on this. Right. So Larry comes into this months later. He finally sort of figured out, damn, the owl could have done this. And they re-examined her scalp. This is the important part. And what did they find in her scalp? 
Oh, they uh, in her scalp they found a broken talon tip. They found in her hands uh, when she was taken to the morgue that morning. Uh, she found 38 hairs in the left hand, 25 in the right hand, and on these hairs, everybody was saying, "Well, they had to, those are the killer's hair." She's obviously pulling her husband's hair. No, all of the hairs that were in both of her hands were her hairs. Every one of them was her hairs. And they didn't know what they were looking at. But the medical examiner did what she's supposed to do. She took those, uh, opened, the medical examiner opened the hand, pulled them out with a lot of flesh on them and everything, put them in the envelope, sealed it up, and sent it off to the SBI trace evidence section in Raleigh. State Bureau of Investigation. Mm -hmm. ran the lab at the time. That's right. And then the next thing uh, she does is the other hand. Well, it comes back within six weeks that on slide 3832 at the, at the trace evidence section of the Attorney General's office, and I being a special prosecutor, this is where I used to go to get my little bitty pieces of evidence. And it was taught me a good lesson because we found out that even though nobody thought there were any feathers around, there happened to be a reference to it on that slide 3832. And I asked to see the slide, we got the slide, put it under a microscope, and voila, there we had it. We had a microscopic feathers, um, and owls are one of the few birds in the world that have microscopic feathers that go all the way down their feet and out here to the toes. Some of these uh, little microscopic feathers that you see have worn out over time because I've taken them in, taken them out in my office, that kind of thing. But at any rate, you will notice that even this little bird, the screech owl, they all have the same thing. They're these little microscopic feathers. Is it your theory that that's what caused all the blood at the scene? Uh, what caused the uh, thing at, at the scene was the fact that she was hit, she was gripped, and this was outside when she's putting up these um, um, Christmas deer decorations. And she's got these lacerations on the back right corner of her head. It just so happens that 90% of owl strikes to human beings are to the back right corner of the head. And these are all things that I started to zero in on because I went to the, more, uh, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, right across from the legislative building, and it is chocked full of evidence. And they have bird wings, they have people that talk to you about stuff. It is a fabulous resource for the state of North Carolina, anywhere, where, not just North Carolina, but experts come here. I forgot to mention, I should, that Larry was counsel to the Speaker of the House in North Carolina. A very, very good position. For, for, sorry, I left that out on your resume. That's all right. So I think uh, your former, uh, is, is Carl Stewart on the, is, is his former Speaker yep. of the House is w watching this, going to watch part of this. All right, keep going, Larry. Okay. Now, now this is something that I went to the hairdresser of Mrs. Peterson two days after she was found at the bottom of the of the thing and they showed the pictures of the wounds. I, somebody had them and I showed them and I said, oh my goodness. And she had all these lacerations right back here. And you can see them in this book. And there are pictures of them. And I'll probably show you some in a minute. But at any rate, I took this to her hairdresser and I said, I want you to take this and cut this mannequin's hair to the style she had it in that night. And that's what we did. And the reason I did that is because there were 10,000 spots of blood on the wall. And I said, no, oh, you can get 10,000 spots of blood. And then I looked at the hair and I said, how many hairs do you have in your head? Got a lot. And not only that, where is all that blood going that from right in here? I found out from the medical examiner's report that all of the wounds were right here they went down to the skull bone, but did not crack the skull. There was no brain damage. There was no contra coup damage, where you get hit here and it bounces off over here. And I said, well, the medical examiner, she's responsible for finding out the cause of death. The cause of death, according to them, was 
blunt force trauma and assiguation, meaning bleeding to death, may have played a part. Well, I said I'll stipulate to both of those, both of those things. Number one, blunt force trauma is this bird flying in at 30 miles an hour and it's coming in very, very fast. Once it comes off that limb, it's aerodynamic, comes in, gets down about this level, and right here is where their feet are. And in these feet and legs, right here and here, there are pulleys, very strong pulleys. And when they come off and they head and get five feet from their talent, I mean from their target, they stick out their feet like that. And the pulleys in here open up the talons. That is the killing field. This is what they use to get their meals with. And believe me, they are, they are deadly. And when you have a chance, if you want to, before the time, you come over here and touch these little things and you'll say, oh goodness gracious, that's sharp. That's a, feels like a needle. And it goes all the way down to the skull bone and stops and grips. And it starts gripping because the inertia of the bird coming into the back of her head makes the uh, limbs right here and here curl up. Larry, let me explain to them. Maybe just one thing I'll say. Okay. And this is a, uh, an important point. They grip like that at 500 pounds of pressure on eight digits. And that's what you have that severed all of the arteries up here on her brain uh, and then supplied the hair, which this is where the blood was coming from that we were seeing all splatter around. Yeah, sure. Now, here you have the scene. It's how many years later before they start to pick a jury? It's about two years later. Right. About two years later before we pick a jury. Larry doesn't figure this out until after the jury is already impaneled and it was way down the trial. So he reports his findings to the special, to, to the prosecutor yep. and to their team and said, listen, guys, uh, the owl did this. They think he's off his rocker by then. They believe they have an iron shut case against the husband. It was not. Now here you've got a crooked a, a, a blood spatter expert because she hit her head on the side of the wall and it splattered. And he gave an opinion that it was blunt force trauma from a blow poke. You happen to the blow poke with you? Hmm? It was a blow, blow poke. Oh, oh, they're on the cell. Oh, I'll just use a stick over here. That's all. Where'd it go? He used a it. blood poke with it. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, that's what the report said. They take it to the jury. The jury comes back unanimously, correct? Mm -hmm. And they stayed out a few hours. Actually, it, the trial, it came down, and this was a trial that went on for four and a half months, it's been the longest criminal trial in the history of North Carolina. And um, they, uh, they came up with the idea that, um, yeah, uh, she must have been struck by a solid instrument like a blow poke, a metal rod. And if there was that, then if there, he's bitten her like this and getting blood on the blow poke, then when he starts to move, blood has weight to it, and it's going to drip off as soon as he takes the first two steps. And I got to thinking, I said, well, he's got this bloody boat poke in his hand. Where's the, the rest of the blood coming from? It's going to be out here. And drip, 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 drip all the way out to the circular drive. I went, aha, there's a clue here, and that is, She's not, he's not running out to go hide the murder weapon. She's coming in after being hit outside and she's bleeding like a stuffed pig. And she's dripping blood all the way in to the house. In other words, she's coming back around uh, where this all took place. She's coming down in here and the circular drive, like I said, is over here. You can see it on these diagrams that I've got. And let's and talk about motive for just a minute. Every sure, has, sure, generally sure. has a motive. There ain't no motive in this. They had a reasonably happy as happy as you can get it 
that age relationship from all we can tell, correct? Right. And exactly. there's no motive for him to kill her. Now, shouldn't we need a motive in this? If you're a member of the jury, there was no motive in this. That's right. No motive. And really, uh, he, he didn't beat her at all. And they found the blow poke in the garage. It wasn't bent at all. And if she'd been beaten with a hollow tube that's copper that long, it would have had some indentures to it. Boy, it didn't have anything. All of this was a mystery, and nobody could figure it out. And the only way that I figured it out it was because I'm a deer hunter. And I, when I go hunting for deer, and I shoot a deer, and he's off in the distance, I have to climb off my stand and go over to the spot, not where he went running into the woods, because my deers, they just don't fall over dead. They take off running, <laughs> and I got to chase them. So I go out not to where they went into the woods at that point. I go to the spot where they're standing when I shot them. And then I line up on the spot where they went into the woods. And those are things about tracking. I got all well, Let's talk like about the show. fun part of this. Sure. How in the world does home box office come to you and tell they're going to make a movie of your crime scene. Yeah. How did they come to you? How did that work out? How did you? And, uh, and Netflix had done one before the Owl Theory had really been developed. Am I correct on all this? Yes, and you're then correct. Home Box Office comes to Larry and said, We'd really like to get this Hollywood actor to play you, and we're going to say you were right in all this. So how did that occur? Well, it occurred because this uh, movie producer. Uh, came down the street and literally walked by the door to my office and my door in and my downtown office Durham. in downtown Durham is right across the street from the courthouse and he comes and taps on the door comes inside and say can I talk to you a little while I said sure and he introduces himself didn't tell me at that time he was doing a movie but he told me that I'd like to talk to you about this owl theory of yours and, uh, and he said I'll, I'll tell you what I got and you're welcome to it and by the way, of 20 years of going up and finding evidence and taking it to uh, uh, different meetings and whether it's civic clubs or coming up here to this law school, I have never taken one penny in compensation for this. Everything that I have done, I have done pro bono, and I did this, and I still am doing it because of the three things that I told you. I have a responsibility to my neighbor. I have an obligation to any and everybody to know what happened, to get to the truth. And I have a sworn duty once I do that and feel as though I know what happened. It's my duty to take it to the authorities, try to get the words out, try to get them to look at this because Mr. Peterson was in jail for eight and a half years. And there was no uh, chance, uh, really, when he was convicted, he was sentenced to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole. And if it hadn't have been for me locating two gentlemen that were actually struck on their, uh, outside their business, and they didn't know what it was that hit him. The big old guy was six, eight, and about 300 pounds. And he all of a sudden, bam, he gets hit in the back of the head on his way out to the car. And it was right around in December, too, in the next December. But everybody, they said, well, what was that? What was that? They didn't know, but they had a uh, camera equipment covering the parking lot of the business. So they went back inside the house, turned on the uh, camera equipment, and then they looked down there, and sure enough, they're walking out to the car, and hit this other guy and himself, and that bird, bam! Hit him right in the back of the head, and when it did, it hit him so hard that it knocked his pants halfway down his legs. Now, you see that even in the tape, and it's incredible. I used them as witnesses in my uh, press conference, and that is, people were saying, oh, owls don't hit people, owls don't do this. Well, they do, and this proved that instance. All of these things, and then I'm telling you little sidebars, are because I've had a lot of things that have come to me not because I'm so smart but because I've been lucky 
and I was taught in prosecutorial school is think outside the box. Think, use your head. Don't just take what's fed to you. Look closely. Think what you can find that's different. And that's what I want to get across to all of the students that are here. Don't be afraid to explore what you think is a possibility. Now, when I was in the state senate, how I sort of got involved, I wrote the motion for appropriate relief law, the new one that we had. We had an old one for years. Most states have an MAR, and if you find newly discovered evidence, then you're able one time, and there's some exceptions, but you're only one time to get back into court with a new judge, a new prosecutor, and everything. But Larry didn't need that. So right while this whole thing is developing, he's getting his witnesses, they find that the blood spatter guy from the SBI is crooked. And he didn't have the credentials he said he would. So lawyers made the motion to get back into court. The uh, Peterson took an Alford plea. That means they've got a lot of evidence out there, but I'm really not guilty of this. It's sort of a hybrid kind of plea. They let him out of prison while Larry was developing the Al theory. Uh, interesting stuff. Now, how in the world did you get a, Did the book guy come to you from? <laughs> uh, this is the latest. This has only been out, what, a few months? This is the latest. And it's called Death by Talents. Tell them the story. Yeah. This is the, another thing, as I said. It, I, I've had so many things just happen to me out of the blue. And it's been kind of an odyssey for me. And. This one is uh, started as the origin of this new book. And it came about because my wife and I were sitting in front of a pizza hut in Durham. And we were waiting to get a pizza for dinner. And I'm sitting there waiting in there, cooking it up, and it's cold outside. And I'm sitting there, and Brenda's sitting over next to me, and there's that way sitting on. All of a sudden, my cell phone jingling, which y'all heard that. And I said, somebody's calling me. And it says it's a Zoom call. And I said, Brenda, what is a Zoom call? And uh, I'll just give you a little insight and Ten years ago, I am not laugh, a techie. No one would have known a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, I but at any rate, uh, I picked up the phone and he said, uh, I'm looking for Larry Pollard. Are you Larry Pollard? And I said, yes, I'm Larry Pollard. And he said, are you Larry Pollard of the Owl Theory? And I said, yes, I guess I am the Owl Theory person. And he said, do you mind... If I ask you a few questions, I said, well, it just depends. Well, why do you want to ask me uh, and what it's about? He said, well, I am a writer of murder mysteries, and you have been uh, come to my attention because you're all over Google. And if you Google me and this, that, and the other, you'll find reams of material on you. And I said, well, what do you want to know? He said, well, do you really think this was done by an owl? I said, yes. I not only think it was done by an owl, I think I can prove it is done by an owl, and that I can prove very quickly that Michael Peterson is an innocent man. And he said, how can you do that? He's been in jail for eight and a half years. I said, yeah, and I'll tell you why he, <laughs> I can prove it. And they said, why? I said, well, number one is uh, that, um, let me see here now. Murder is the unlawful killing of another human being. It's in your books, you read it, it's all the elements of the criminal offense and this kind of thing. And it implies that somebody has to kill somebody. Now, in this instance, there wasn't a somebody that killed Kathleen. It was something. And that something is an owl. That doesn't qualify as a homicide. If it's not a homicide, it can't be first degree murder. It can't be second degree murder. It can't be manslaughter, which they wanted him to plead to in order to eventually accept his offered plea. So they wanting him to plead guilty to something that is not a crime and hasn't been proven. So by law, Mr. Peterson is automatically an innocent man simply because it doesn't meet a homicide. 
It doesn't meet any of the definition of murder. And nobody's been able to prove anything other than, oh, well, no, it has to be this, it has to be that. Uh-uh. Go back and look. I did the looking. And that's what I've been saying. He is innocent by his own fact that so this there, murder... Other people believe you, too. This is an article that was put out. It's entitled, Larry Pollard's Owl Theory. Officials should get serious about the idea that Kathleen Peterson was killed by an owl. Ama amazing kinds of stuff. And he's been on television talk shows and everything else with regard to this. Uh, and uh, Larry, we're sort of going to wrap this up because we're about at our, sure. our time. We have to take I'm, a break. Uh, where, where does this go to from now? For, where, I know you're, you just spoke to a couple thousand people in New Orleans on this. Right, I and, did. And other ways. And I think what we want these fine law students to know is don't always do a rush to justice because there may be another theory out there. Right. And the jury didn't have this. They didn't have this evidence. They had, gosh, was it a four-month trial? It was four months' worth of evidence. They did not have this. Now, had you had it, he would have been entitled, as the lawyer, to go into court for a motion for appropriate relief, to, to find justice, and that's why that, the, 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 bill, the bill was written for justice. But the, I did. the blood I guy was a crook, and you can find that stuff, but it took eight years of a man's life yeah. sitting in rotten jail cells uh, to come to this. And when was your last conversation with Michael Peterson? You, you talked to him every once in a while. Oh, I talked to Michael probably two days ago. And the reason I talked to him, and I'll, I think, you know, he probably wouldn't have mind me telling you this, but Michael had taken over two children from when he was over in Germany. Now, the father of these two children, the two girls, uh, he took the custody of them because they had cross wills. They were both in the military. And it says, if something happens to me, uh, I want you to take my children and raise them. And in turn, if you have something that happens to you, and I'll take your children and raise them. And so they do that in the military a lot. And in this instance, that uh, mother of one of the two daughters that he took under his wing to raise and raised them, took them to college and all this other stuff, uh, he still keeps in touch with. She's now 40 years old. But he called me up to let me know that unfortunately, uh, about two weeks ago, she had a stroke. Hmm. And um, I'm not going to divulge her name or whatever, but I wanted to go ahead and just let you know that Michael was uh, calling me to make me aware of the fact that this young lady had had a stroke. Now, she's very, very um, smart. She's got a career that's going to be in, uh, soon will be in medicine. And she's just a delightful young lady. And we all wish her the very best. And he was calling me to let me know that she is recuperating and doing well. So, do I talk to Michael? Yeah, I talk to Michael. And I talk to Michael. I call him up and I say, Michael, what are you doing this afternoon? Are you out there taking your five-mile walk in the woods? Are you out there in Walden's Woods or whatever? And he, we joke back and forth like that. All right. So. We have time for three, four questions. We must break in, in five sure. minutes. Who would give the first question that we haven't discussed? I will repeat the question for the television folk and stuff here. Who has a question? Don't be shy. Because more than likely, I'm not going to know the answer, but go ahead. <laughs> Take a shot. Question. Sure. Well, how did Michael Peterson feel when you told him your theory? How does... How, how did Michael Peterson feel Excellent. when now, you told him your theory? And, and for the cameras, she well, asked, how did he feel? You're he, telling the guy's innocent. Well, Michael had been convicted. He was in jail. Been there for a while. And... Like I said, remember those guys I was talking about that were hit in the back on the, in the parking lot? And they had had that tape recorded on the camera equipment outside. Well, the executive director of the Wildlife Commission 
knew me well because I helped get his bill through the General Assembly. And also, I was willing to call him up and ask for help. And I said, uh, he said, Larry, I got somebody here that I want you to talk to. Uh, who's that? And he said, these two guys were hit last night by an owl. I said, yeah, I've heard of, you know, people get hit all the time. He said, no, they got this one on film. And you might want to come and see it. And so I went out <laughs> to see it, and sure enough, they had the thing right there. Bingo. Big guy gets hit, knocks his pants off practically. They run back inside. You see droplets of blood all over the ground. And she said, uh, I said, do you mind if I take a copy of this uh, film? He said, yeah, I'll let you have it. So he gave it to me, and I took it immediately over to WRAL-TV in Raleigh and gave it to um, David Crabtree. Crabtree. David Crabtree. And they put it on the 12 o'clock news show. And Michael was sitting in the can, can uh, whatever the room is with Canteen. all the yeah, with all the guys in there playing cards or watching TV and this that and the other. And Michael's over there reading or writing. He's a very erudite young man, well, old man, and he's a, a very interesting man. So all of a sudden that thing showed up on TV and the people, his fellow inmates, turned around and said, "Hey, Michael, you need to come over here and see this." Your next door neighbor's not as crazy as you think he is. And I'm sitting there thinking, you mean to tell me he thinks I'm crazy and I'm trying to get him out of jail? That's not much gratitude. But at any rate, sure enough, he came over and he looked at it. It took about 10 minutes for him to be able to get to a telephone down there and called me. They have one phone on them and the whole thing for all the inmates. And he called me up and said, Larry, I've just seen this on television. Have you seen that? I said, yeah. He said, are you, are you aware of it? I said, I'm the one that took it over to the station. And he went, oh, well, do you think this would uh, be what happened? And I said, uh, yeah, I think it is good proof. And he said, well, will you come down here and represent me on the owl theory? I said, I uh, can't, Michael. I can't represent you in court on the owl theory because of the fact that you already have an attorney. It's being unethical for me to do that. But what I can do is I can come down and meet with you and I can represent you on the owl theory. That's not the court stuff of uh, being in, court, in the courtroom and everything else at that time. Yeah, I can come down, I can look at it, I can find out if it's worthy, this, that, and the other. He said, would you come down on Tuesday? And then I said, yeah, I'll come down in two days. And I went in and went to see him. We sat down, we talked, he looked at it, he said, now do you really think this is possible? I said, I definitely do. And I've been telling people, and nobody wants to believe it, but I think that I can prove that, this, that your wife, Kathleen, was hit in the back right corner of the head and the wounds were inflicted by a bird of prey. That is not a homicide. Let me ask you this question. Why yeah. didn't they put a polygraph on it? Now, polygraph's not admissible in North Carolina. It's admissible in other states. It's admissible in federal court. Did they ever give Michael Peterson a polygraph? Said, did you kill your wife? Uh, I don't think they did, and the reason I don't think they did was that would be something that he and his lawyer, David Rudolph, would have decided. Uh, and I didn't want to get in the middle of that. I, I went to see David uh, later on when I perfected most of the stuff I needed for the Al Theory and further. And uh, we met uh, David. Uh, in Chapel Hill with his other partner, Tom Maher, and I was explaining to him the owl theory. And I saw him, he was really concentrating very, very hard and looking at it. And I could look at him and I could see the wheels turning in his head, going like that, and I thought, oh man, he's really eating this up. And he looked around and I said, what do you think, David? He said, I think it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life, and if anybody asks me, I'm gonna tell them that. It's my advice to you not to say one word about this to anybody. And after we get through going through the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court, which is the normal path you have to go, uh, that uh, we'll look at it then. And I went, <laughs> too bad, David. This is already out. It's all over the news. People have been talking about it, etc. cetera. And I, the our theory belongs to me. All right, one of your questions out there. They had a French 
television crew follow the lawyers from the get-go here. They cut some kind of deal with a fil film, film crew who filmed the private moments of them sitting around talking about the murder, talking about the family. They did a whole doc documentary on it. What effect do you think that on, had on the lawyers in the courtroom and other things? I, I wouldn't want somebody filming my private moments with clients or theories or anything like that, but in this case they did. I guess for profit, correct? Oh yeah, most of them do. How did all, how did all that come about? <laughs> I don't know. We don't know. They, they, they make a deal. Uh, attorneys are like anybody, they have a profession and they charge for their work and their uh, deeds and uh, they had to hire some very high-powered witnesses to come in and testify about uh, blood splatter and this, that, and the other. Well, I wasn't involved in all that. I was next door, and I was just sitting over there watching, but I, there was a whole lot of stuff that was going on that I was very privy to. I was probably the first one to actually see the pattern of the wounds on Mrs. Peterson's head. They were a Xerox copy of the actual wounds. It was supplied to me by another lawyer. And when they retested the head again, they had missed that evidence. And at, at the get-go, and you helped involved with that. One last question before we break. Yeah, as your theory was developing and you were seeing things like the claw marks, did you ever run into a fact that you were like, wait a second, maybe my theory is actually crazy? Did you have, like, did, did you run into something that made you doubt your own self and your own theory? Good question. The, the biggest question that I had was I would be sitting in my basement at home and the ha the TV would be right there in front of me if I have a big screen television. I'd be sitting there at night watching what went on in the trial that day. And I kept thinking, you know, what could have made those lacerations on her head? And I thought, well, it couldn't have been a dog. And, I, it looked, and when I first looked at them, I said, those look like turkey tracks. I said, but they're too big to be turkey tracks. And then I said, well, it couldn't be this, it couldn't be that. And I kept ruling things out. And I was sitting in my basement just kind of cogitating, wonder what it was that made those marks on her head. And I started going into a trance, another one of these aha moments. Well, anyway, I turned around, I looked up on my wall here, and I got a great big deer head up there. And it's looking down at me, and it's got those big brown eyes looking at me. And I was looking up at it, and I was sitting there thinking, I, I was thinking, I get this funny feeling. I said, what are you, what are you doing? What are you trying to communicate? Saying? I feel like something was telepathic coming to me. And I said, I remember the night I shot you, and you went running off, and it had started to rain, and I had to come off my stand and go over to the spot where you were. And then I, and then I had to follow that line of where she went in the woods. And he said, that's it. That's it. That's the blood trail. That's the blood trail I was following. The whole word, the definition, blood trail. And that is what turned everything around for me, was my sporting and the fact that I'm a hunter and I practice those kind of tips right in here, tips for tracking and everything. I study this like I do an algebra test and whatever. Now, that's what I did. I got to the bird and he got to the animal and found it didn't have any problem, and I realized those droplets of blood were coming not of him taking, going out the walkway to the circular drive. It was her coming in from the circular drive. That's what turned everything around because all of a sudden you got not a person that is doing this, but a wild bird. That established it because all the droplets of blood are outside the house. And he hasn't been outside the house yet with any blow poke or anything else. So how did those get there? She's got a lot of lacerations on the back right corner of her head. And then the investigators get there that night, and they're looking around at all these spots coming down the walkway, and they're saying, oh, what is all this? It looks like leaves or they're kind of white and whatever. I'm going to blow them over to the side. And this is all in this book here. And they blew them over to the side. 
picked them up. They didn't even know what they were looking at. They had no earthly idea at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I can't blame them for that. I've been bleary-eyed that time. But they took all of these bundles of white feathers. It's in the book. You can see the feathers on the walkway. And then they took them inside, put them in a pot, put them on the stove, cooked them, and then they poured them down the drain and poured, um, you might not know about this, but when owls poop, it's called CC, and it's acid from the stomach. And when an owl kills something, it eats everything from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. And as such, the acid that's in the stomach helps them to digest it. This is how you locate where an owl is because when they want to excrete something, or let, uh, let go of something, go to the bathroom, they squirt. Like I bet that. 10 years from now, you'll, ne you'll, you'll remember this. If you ever see an owl anywhere, and you'll remember this. Larry Potter, thank you for coming back to work. Oh, yeah, man. We're going to take a 10-minute break. But don't leave because we're changing our schedule a little bit. And... Uh, we're going to pass out some cards and got a new little thing, and I'll see everybody in 10 minutes. Well, I'll, I'll and he'll be here you, for questions. I'm going to tell you this. In the paper, the day before yesterday, it says here, Raptor attacking Chapter Hillians prompts Al Capone t-shirts. And they go down in the article, and this was kind of funny to me. It starts hey, talking two about days the ago. Michael Peterson murder case from years ago. And that was in the, it's been in the news, it stays in the news, and whatever. Thank you, everybody. See you in 10 minutes. Yep. Fascinating. And I'll be glad to take any questions you may have. Feel free. Wow. I'm going to get ready for the next half. I had a question. Based off the process that you had to go through with all of this, do uh -huh. you hope that this story sort of inspires any changes in, like, treatment of evidence and the whole criminal process in general? Well, I'm in hopes that it makes y'all that are here in this classroom and those of you that are taking criminal law and might take a career in criminal law, uh, you might want to remember what I said. Be careful. Yeah. Be able to mm, use your head. Think outside the box, especially if you're a defensive person mm -hmm. because you want to find that little uh, grain of sand that turns everything around. And the reason I say that there's another article I got in here somewhere where some guy that murdered, was accused of murder 30 years ago, had spent 30 years in prison and just recently has gotten out simply because one of the witnesses that was in his case changed his testimony. And they, and they took it to the, the Innocence Commission. And at the Innocence Commission, it's probably in here, yeah, here it is. Conviction vacated for man sentenced for shooting North Carolina officer. And that's, I brought that and I put it in here so that if anybody wanted to look at it. Yeah. And that's what I'm looking at right now to possibly be able to petition the court of, uh, well, it's not the court. You petition, uh, it's called the uh, Innocence Commission. And you've got to prove uh, that by clear and convincing evidence, clear and convincing, that either someone else did the crime or it wasn't a crime mm -hmm. or something like that. Well, I'm sitting here in Batter's box and I'm saying, I don't think this was a crime. As I just told y'all, I've told you, this was done by an owl. That doesn't qualify as a homicide. Right. If it's not a homicide, can't be murder one, can't be murder two, can't be manslaughter. So it automatically, in my opinion, is good grounds to ask the Innocence Commission to look at it again. Now, they have other rules um, that they go by, and whether or not it meets all the criteria, I don't know. Uh, Michael has not suggested me to do it yet. Michael has been involved in this case as long as I have, for 20 years or more. And it's eaten away at him. Right. He's a lot older. He's now out free. He doesn't have to go worry about having to go back to jail. If I was going to try the case, I was going to have to pour out a lot of money for expert witnesses and all this other stuff. 
But this way, he made the offer plea that allowed him to get out of jail. He gave him, uh, they gave him his passport back. They said he can go anywhere he wants to go. He's paid his debt to society, mm -hmm. and he says, I don't want to be bothered by it anymore. Uh, he's 78 years old, I yeah. and I think he's taken the thing, I'm lucky I'm still alive. And the reason I say that is he was in Vietnam. Right. And everybody thought that he had gotten wounded in Vietnam, and he did. He was wounded twice. And I mean, he got two medals, one, uh, what do they call it, bronze stars. One of them with, uh, what do they call it, with valor. Scar, what they call valor. It? Yeah, those little things that hang on that medal, meaning that you got him in battle. And actually, though, it was kind of funny. He was running for mayor in the city of Durham before any of all this stuff happened. And the reporter came and sat and tapped on his door, and he came out started talking to him, and they said, well, we see, we see where you limped over to the door. He said, yes, no war injury. And um, they said, oh, you were uh, wounded in, in your leg during the war? And uh, got, uh, he said, yeah, I got a purple ribbon. And they said that he got a purple heart. He Very did different. not have a purple heart, and they nailed him on that in his mayoral campaign is what it was. Yeah. And uh, he, uh, ex way he ex explained it to me was that a they give purple ribbons instead of a purple heart if you have a wound, but it's a superficial wound, mm. and it's not as serious as the people who receive purple hearts. Right. Those people, they deserve that medal, and they deserve everything that we can do for them. I can imagine some of what these guys in Vietnam and what they're doing over in the Ukraine and what they do in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan, war as hell. And oh, these guys are, they're the tip of the spear for us. And we've got to show them respect and honor them. And hopefully that they will, you know, get well, get better. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. No, thank you very much. Oh, really yeah, sure, that. sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was wondering how Dennis Rowe and Liz Ratliff fit into the owl theory, or can their injuries be attributed to something similar? Tell me uh, how you know Dennis Rowe. I just did some research beforehand. Okay. All right. That's interesting because they were always batting around that name, that Dennis mm -hmm. Rowe, right. and that he had known Kathleen, I think was who he had known in the past. And everybody was trying to insinuate that it, uh, he was the one that came over and did something or got maybe, maybe I don't know. I'm not over there. I'm a next door neighbor. And we've got a fence that's this high between me and their land and right. that barn that's over there. So I don't have a chance to go over all the time, although I would go. I mean, Michael doesn't uh, bother me because I know that he wasn't, he was very kind to me even before all this happened. He helped me move a great big marlin, I'd call it. And it had a huge box in my garage. I said, what am I going to do with this thing? I need somebody to help me lift it up. It's going to be a four or five hundred fish. Well, uh, when we opened up the box and pulled the fish out, the fish was very light because it's hollow. It has nothing but a piece of plastic left. And so he and I both just kind of took this thing and wheeled it around and stuck it up on the wall. And uh, he helped me on that. My wife ran for Secretary of State back in 1997 or something like that. At any rate, she was running for that, uh, and uh, I got him to write a press release for Brenda, who, was, who had filed a run for the office of Secretary of State. And she did run. She placed, what, third in that? What, John? I can't yeah. remember. Something like that? Yeah. Third? And what she, year was that? I think it was like 1996, 97. But she uh, she did a great job. She had she won that race, she would have been running against um, uh, what is it, the guy that drives the car, Richard Petty. And what we did, we didn't know how we were going to campaign or how Brenda was going to campaign this thing. We didn't have any money, and but Brenda had the knowledge because she'd been Secretary of State Thad Ewer's executive assistant and worked for him for 20 years. She knew the office she of was Secretary the Secretary of State. Yeah, she was the Secretary of State. 
But at any rate, we, uh, we had a lot of fun. I had that white Suburban at that time, and, uh, and everybody was talking about, well, if you win, you're going you're gonna to be racing Michael, uh, you know, what's his name, Petty, Richard, Richard Petty. Richard Petty. And I, was, I couldn't wait to get me a hat. And, and, you know, a big flower up here and get me some dark glasses. And then we were going to put stickers all over the white Suburban that I had. And then I put on the side doors, I had some things that stuck on this. Number one in your heart, number this, that, and the other. Uh, anyway, we had a lot of fun. We went all over the state. Trying, and Brenda had more fun. She made more things. And she had the greatest little TV ad I've ever seen. And that was her... Uh, the camera is on her, and you see this radio, and the radio comes in and says, "Oh, and they're coming around car number one, so it's going around uh, the the turn number three, and that's and oh, there's Brenda Pollard. She's pulled into the lead. She's pulled into the lead, and this kind of thing. And about this time, you hear all these cars going by, and uh, and about that time, it switches over to her, and she's sitting there with this racing helmet on, and she looks like a race car driver. And the next thing is she pulls her head over like that, and she shakes her head, and she has this distinctive dark hair. Doesn't she, John? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and she goes like that, and this hair falls out all over the place, and she looks around at the camera, and you see that it's a woman, and she says, I don't know anything about racing a car, but in the race for Secretary of State, I'm the only one that has any experience. I've been... The the executive assistant for the president's secretary of state for 20 years. And it says, vote for Pollard. <laughs> she didn't win, but whatever. And, but she was running with pretty stiff competition.